When I was young, my world was full of mystery. An adventure awaited behind every tree, every bush. Rivers and water meadows especially fascinated me. Each was an enchanted paradise with glittering jewels and creatures from other times. This is where I began to discover nature and see the world with new eyes. And that's why I became a biologist and why I constantly come back to the rivers of my childhood. Rivers like the ochre and all the little miracles that can still be found here today. The ochre has many faces. She carves her way cool and clear through a shady rocky bed near her source in Germany's Harz Mountains. Then she snakes through the lowlands, transforming these northwest German plains into magical water meadows. I spend every spare minute on the river and immerse myself in another world first as a biology professor, and now, together with my wife, simply out of our passion for nature. My favorite animals hide out in the reed jungle, banded demoiselles. The males sport blue wings. The females' wings are clear as glass. As a child, I took them for butterflies, for their delicate, fluttering flight. My wife loved banded demoiselles too, so we started researching them. Filming these little dragons in slow motion revolutionized our understanding of them. It revealed their remarkable hunting technique. They make a basket with their long, bristly legs and pluck their prey out of the sky. Dead nettles grow downstream, miracles of nature with flowers like tiny orchids. In spring, the chickweed attracts insects with pollen and nectar. Old meadows offer living space, and among whole breeders, demand is high. The first to show an interest is a blue tit. It needs a hole with enough space for a big family. A blue tit family can be up to 16 strong. There's only so many places that suit. While down below, a rustling announces another potential tenant. But this charming country home doesn't seem to meet the field mouse's needs. A pair of great tits arrive for an inspection too. That doesn't thrill the blue tit at all. It's amazing how plucky a little bird can be.
the great tits decide on a rapid departure. So the blue tit made the winning bid. Now he can begin decorating the place. Tits line their nest with moss or animal hairs. A few tufts of sheep's wool are ideal. Now the female has to give her approval. While she examines it critically, the male comes by with a present. She'll need a lot of energy to make her eggs. It's a good start, but is it enough to win her over? Blue tits generally mate repeatedly. That strengthens the bond between them. As does billing and cooing, whispering sweet nothings. Striped field mice are fond of the water meadows too. So are common buzzards. Striped field mice are amazingly good swimmers. Looks like it got away. The morning sun has warmed the demoiselles. Now the males have plenty of energy to fight for a territory. This is no duel to the death. It's an iridescent beauty contest, each male displaying his sapphire wings in the best possible light. The males will use their big blue spots to impress the females. But first, to intimidate their male rivals. Beating all four wings synchronously, the spots merge in a striking blur of color. This language of signals can chase away rivals without harming either party. It took the technology of slow motion to unravel the language of the wings. The males hover over the water plants, where the females will soon come to lay their eggs. This is definitely territory to fight for. The females don't claim a territory, but flit through the water meadows. When they arrive around midday, the males must be ready to display. Deer come down to the banks to drink. Foxes, too. The roebuck is constantly on guard. For the does are grazing nearby. 
They haven't picked up the scent of the vixen yet, but their ears miss nothing at all. They let the vixen get very close. But then, they're off. Better watch out, mice. Far upstream, high in the Hearts Hills, the ochre shows a different side. Here it's a fast-flowing brook, Habitat for a very different species, the rare golden-ringed dragonfly. Its eggs will be protected in thick layers of moss until they're ready to hatch. The golden rings need cold, clear water. As their larvae ambush their prey in gravel beds. but they're in danger themselves. They must stay alert for a most unusual insect eater. The Dipper. This is the only European songbird that can swim and even dive. It can stay underwater for up to 30 seconds. With its short but broad wings, it swims underwater like a penguin. It can close its nostrils and ears with waterproof membranes. A layer of air trapped by its feathers gives it that silver sheen and keeps it dry. There aren't that many prey animals in the cold mountain brooks, so the dipper leaves no stone unturned to find enough to eat. Stoneflies or dragonfly larvae, the dipper will eat them all. Tiny fish, too. The golden ring larva is similar. It eats pretty much anything. Here, its labial mask has bagged a freshwater shrimp. With low temperatures and limited prey, it can only grow slowly. It may spend up to seven years underground. Besides larvae, dippers snap up fully grown insects too. A rare martagon lily grows close to the riverbank, serenaded by the dipper's song. Back downstream, something remarkable is about to take place. It's noon, and the female banded demoiselles are arriving. It's time for a very special display. The male's mating flights. To impress the females, they beat their wings no less than 50 times a second, almost three times as fast as in normal flight. 
It takes an enormous amount of energy. But that's the point. The females pick only the fittest males to pass on their genes. Now the male grasps his partner by the neck. The female moves her vagina round to the semen sac on the underside of the male. Dragonfly hearts and wheels are united all around the riverbank. If the female has already mated, the male will remove his rival semen before depositing his own. These banded demoiselles have reinforced scientists' views that mating serves only the transmission of one's own genes, not the survival of the species. To make absolutely sure he's the father, the male escorts his partner to the egg-laying patch. He won't let her out of his sight, for fertilization doesn't happen until the eggs are laid. The demoiselles lay several dozen eggs on the stalks of water plants. They'll be safe there for the two to four weeks till the larvae emerge. In the early morning, delicate mists veil the water meadows. The vixen is out hunting again. For a few weeks now, she's had puppies to feed. Still a bit too young for their first excursions, they're busy playing at home. But the sounds of the outside world break in. They're perfectly safe with the wren. It's all happening with the blue tits. Two weeks after mating, a dozen chicks have hatched. The parents constantly bring colorful caterpillars and insects and leave with colorless poo. Each brood will consume up to 3,000 insects and larvae. Songbirds are natural pest controllers. Back in the water meadows, we find the biggest of all the dragonflies hereabouts, the emperors. They are true masters of aerobatics. In contrast to the banded demoiselles, they prefer still waters in ponds and in the side arms of healthy water meadows. The moment of egg laying is especially dangerous. Their compound eyes may pick up the tiniest movement, but this coot still manages to sneak up. And a one gram dragonfly is a nice protein snack for her chick. A twin pack would of course be even better. This youngster is already trying out its hunting skills. But until it gets the knack, it'll just have to make do.
Early summer is high season for the ochre's damselflies, something their predators are happy to take advantage of. A well-chosen resting place. will protect you from the most determined enemy. And a desirable resting place will be in high demand. A female emperor dragonfly laying her eggs. Another male is the last thing she needs. With a delicate pirouette, she shakes off her admirer. Similar skills may save her from determined predators. And those powerful flight muscles can rescue the Emperor from the most perilous situation. But it's better not to come into range in the first place. Broad-bodied chaser females simply drop their eggs into the water. If that means they can't conceal their eggs, they make up for it in numbers. Enough of them will survive. And more females will survive too. Emperor dragonflies don't bomb their eggs from the air. They have to descend to the surface. But the strength of those muscles. The Ochre's water meadows are the domain of a fabulous flying jewel. The Kingfisher, bright as a bird of paradise, way up here in the cool north. The Ochre is full of its main food, fish. The male watches from his vantage point before the precision plunge at his target. The female looks on with interest. Success at last. This is a special fish. It's a gift. You impress a female by doing what you do best. And kingfishers certainly deserve that name. Where the ochre is allowed to make its way untrammeled through the plain, it carves steep, loamy banks. 
They're ideal for cavity nesters like kingfishers. This pair will dig down almost half a meter. You'll get a dusty beak. But water is good for washing as well as hunting. And an immaculate kingfisher impresses his partner. Soon she'll lay between five and seven eggs. Other families are way ahead of them. At three weeks, the blue tit chicks are fully fledged and never stop demanding food. Their mouths haven't quite developed into beaks yet. Early summer is caterpillar time. There are enough to satisfy even this big family. This little one begs, but the others get all the food. That's not fair. How did they get a better place? Not everything is so idyllic along the ochre's banks. Close to towns, the river is hemmed in by fields and roads. In Wolfenbüttel, the ochre has flowed through the canals and moats surrounding the town since the 16th century. But the green areas along its banks are home to songbirds, and so sparrowhawks like these spaces too. Sparrowhawks have no problem finding food for their young here. The father is no bigger than a jay and considerably smaller than the mother. He doesn't feed the chicks himself. He passes the prey over to the mother for plucking. As father flies out again, mother tugs the prey into beak-sized morsels. Sparrowhawks apply a strict division of labor. The mother feeds and the father hunts. Sparrowhawks have found their niche in the towns. It's not for everyone. After 10 kilometers, the ochre reaches Braunschweig. Here, just as in Wolfenbüttel, it divides into several branches. Like so many rivers, the ochre was once a vital transport artery. In the Middle Ages, it made Braunschweig into a mighty mercantile city. Henry the Lion extended the boundaries of the town in the mid-12th century by draining marshlands.
Today, the current is slowed by weirs. Sediment deposits cause mud flats. But as soon as the ochre leaves Braunschweig behind, she can flow unhindered, following her natural course. Water plants, working together with microscopic life forms, combine as one great organic water treatment plant. Exotically named Thousand Leaf, Starwort, and Spatterdock host countless single celled animals that filter sediment and bacteria. Microscopic creatures that feed water fleas, eaten in turn by long armed hydra. And by dragonfly larvae. Quick as a flash, their armored mouthparts strike. The dragonflies spend the greater part of their lives as larvae, many months, sometimes even several years. Hard to believe this ugly duckling will soon be a magnificent dragonfly. Early in the morning, the dragonflies climb out of the water. The timing is important because it's still cool and damp. A freshly hatched insect mustn't dry out. The chitin exoskeleton mustn't harden until they've stretched to their full length. Within a few hours, these delicate creatures are fully developed. But half of the newborn dragonflies end in the stomachs of insect eaters like black caps. Unlike the little banded demoiselles, the bigger dragonflies carry their transparent wings spread their entire lives. The maiden flight launches them into their few weeks of adult life. Beavers have no interest in dragonflies, either as larvae or as adults. They're 100% vegetarian. Not so kingfishers. Larvae are ideal food for freshly hatched chicks. Fish will come later. Three weeks later, they're being fed in the open air. The head always comes first, so it doesn't stick in the throat. The chicks beg ceaselessly. Their parents are less and less inclined to respond. Now the young have to watch and learn to hunt. Fishing, the sport of kings. And you start with insects and larvae. But sometimes, the cupboard stays bare. Beavers are a conservation success story for the ochre. 
They've only been here a few years. Ore mining in the Hartz Mountains polluted the river with arsenic and heavy metals for centuries. When the mining stopped, the water quality improved. These large rodents are most active in the early hours. They've worked on this tree for many a night. Beavers fell the trees to get to their twigs and branches. They eat them and use them to build their dams and lodges. Their favorite foods are fresh herbs and grasses. Beavers live in small family groups, marking the borders of their territory with a scent from a special gland. It's called castoreum, after the Latin for beaver. Thanks to conservation work, many beavers have found a new home in the ochre. A very special raptor lives in the reed beds, the marsh harrier. Unlike most birds of prey, the marsh harrier nests on the ground in the midst of the dense reeds. A male returns to the female with a mouse. He normally transfers the prey in the air, usually a straightforward maneuver for these agile birds. This time, the female miscalculated. But the male won't give up. A kite has discovered the male with the mouse, and he's ready to fight over it. With the mouse in his grip, the marsh harrier is defenseless. Raptors need their claws to fight. But the harrier won't give it up. His three young need every morsel they can get. And he's done it. But the harrier faces another interloper. The male can't tolerate that. Though the buzzard eats mice and won't harm the chicks, the harrier doesn't want him anywhere near the nest. made and there's nothing more to see in the water meadows a heron has caught a long-legged bandit but the frogs themselves are scarcely harmless they'll eat anything smaller than themselves even their own species. Whatever your size, 
You need to keep watch for a silent, deadly hunter. A grass snake slips through the water meadows in search of amphibians. Perhaps the coot is a little too big. Sensors on its tongue locate appropriate prey. But frogs can shift too. This seems like a good spot. A baby frog like this is only a little morsel. When the sun warms the stones, you can spot grass snakes hunting all along the river. Discovering that frogs aren't always easy prey. the start of a real tug of war. A fight for life that could go either way. And the frog made it. Suddenly, it begins to snow in the middle of summer. The snowstorm is caused by the seeds of willow trees. The wind can carry them for kilometers on their feathery fronds. For little insects and spiders, this snowfall is a temporary obstacle. But after a few days, the magic is gone. It can't go fast enough for a male banded demoiselle. Any extra ballast makes it harder to impress a female. As summer advances, more and more hatch. Competition makes the males more aggressive, so females duck under to lay their eggs in peace. Every now and then, a male takes a short break before diving back into the fray. Now, the delicate white-legged damselflies are mating too, and they're claiming the very same egg-laying spots as the banded demoiselles. This is a first, seeing a banded demoiselle carrying away a white-legged damselfly couple. One of the few demoiselle females is now mobbed by a whole swarm of males.
the female tries to shake off her pursuers by diving underwater. One of the males reaches her, but the others are instantly on the scene. In spring, we know them as delicate, fluttery creatures. By high summer, they're single-minded scrappers. The female struggles free, while another dives just in time to escape her pursuers. At the end of the season, only one thing counts. Pass on your genes at any price. The cabbage white butterfly takes it easier. The young marsh harriers are now six weeks old and curious about the outside world. Their father teaches them to catch prey in the air. It'll take practice. The siblings perfect their timing with mock attacks. Try again. Got it. And that is a cry of triumph. He's ready now for life in the water meadows. It's late summer and the insect year is nearing its end. Only the darters still have to lay their eggs. The summer sun has dried out the flooded water meadows. but the groundwater never lets them get completely parched. For the darters, egg laying is a matter of safety in numbers. And they lay them in couples. That way the male can be quite sure he's the father. That calls for elegant maneuvering at the expense of speed. They have to hit the water with exactly the right timing and at the right angle. Life as a low-flying biplane has distinct disadvantages. For a white wagtail, a single data is too maneuverable. Next spring, a new generation of data larvae will hatch. For now, some of their parents are caught while still in tandem. Darters live longer than many other dragonfly species, if they get enough sun. If they cool down, they can no longer hunt, and they starve. They can't fly south in the winter like swallows.
Right now, the darters can find enough food. But soon the air will be cold and empty. And yet, the next dragonfly generation already slumbers in the water meadows, and in the spring their gossamer wings will once again take to the skies. The magic world of the ochre has never lost its hold on me. As long as I live, I shall never stop exploring the fascinating fauna of the water meadows. For if you look closely, a whole world of wonder and beauty reveals itself. Generations come and go. The water meadows remain. And for me, this is the most beautiful place in the world.